Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. And I've got a special guest. I'm here with Dr. Joe Rigney, who is a fellow of theology at New St. Andrews, and he has a new book coming out on leadership and emotional sabotage. And interestingly, although that book is about to come out, the reason I reached out to him was because I found an article he wrote on general revelation, and I was amazed by it because I skimmed down to the footnotes. I was certain he must have quoted me, but he didn't because great minds think alike. <laughs> he came to some conclusions, which I think are really important conclusions about general revelation. So thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And, and uh, people who watch my my YouTube channel know that I interview uh, scholars from different fields, also politicians about uh, issues facing us today. And it might seem strange to people, maybe in the general population, but I actually think general revelation is a significant problem facing us today. And for some of the reasons that you mention in your article, I'm going to share the screen just to point out a couple of things and ask you questions as we're going. Right. Yeah. Great. So it's your article with one voice yeah. from June 5th, 2019. Yeah. And you're talking about the importance of scripture and you quote the Westminster Confession. You and I both agree about the Westminster Confession. So we have that in common about why scripture is authoritative. But then you say some things about general revelation and, and you define it here. You say creation itself is revelatory and this revelation is not sporadic occasional or limited to one segment of creation rather god's revelation of himself in creation is pervasive and constant so that's a good introduction to people who wonder what is general revelation well creation itself reveals who god is to everybody so everyone has access in some level to general relation and then you define it specifically here you say general revelation is god's revelation of himself in creating sustaining and governing the world. So I think that's a great definition of general revelation. But your points below, I think these are somewhat controversial. And I know that's okay with you. You're not afraid of saying controversial things, but I want to kind of help our audience know why these are controversial. The first point, general revelation is the first and foundational revelation upon all upon which all subsequent revelation is built. Special revelation is special because it presupposes the existence of general revelation. Now, you can anticipate people will be troubled by that because they'll say, no, you've got to go right to the Bible first. So can you explain your thoughts a little bit there? Yeah. So um, there's, there's, so the, the impulse to want to say, but scripture first, scripture is the, is the norm. Scripture is the um, final standard. All of that is good and right. And this isn't opposed to it at all. Um, the issue is um, the first way that we learn about anything is from our existence as creatures in the world God made. And the world God made is constantly communicating about him. So even before we're sort of cognitively able to comprehend it, like when we're infants, when we're in utero, um, we are receiving communication from, from God. God is, God is speaking to us um, in, in everything. And the fact that we may not be able to um, hear it either because of our finitude, because we're we're um, finite creatures, we're immature, we're infants, um, or because of our sinfulness. As we grow up, we have a sinful um, heart that suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. Um, neither of those matters. The, the The revelation is there whether or not we respond rightly to it or comprehend it fully at all. And so this is what Paul is teaching us, I think, in Romans chapter 1. It's the classic text on general revelation where he says... Um, what can be known about God is evident to them. God has made it plain to them. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, all, all of God's um, attributes are clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So since the creation, all, all along the way, um, God's nature and attributes are revealed. So one of the ways I say it is that um, all of the made things in the world make invisible attributes visible. So made yeah. things make invisible attributes visible. And that comes first before we ever get to language learning and the ability to read and hear the Bible and respond to it appropriately. Um, God is speaking to us in creation. 
Yeah, that's great. I, I love that, that the invisible attributes of God are made known through his works. Because yeah. just going through the Psalms, how many times are we told in the Psalms, consider the works of God? And then the psalm will spell some of those out for us, and those generally have to do either with creation or with redemptive history. Mm -hmm. And so the creation part is one of the works of God, and we're, if we love God, we want to know God in all the ways he's revealed himself to us. Yeah, that's right. Um, now, you, you kind of answered a question I have here in the little bubble, um, but I was going to ask you, how does general revelation make God known? And the reason I'm asking that, I'm, I'm, my PhD is in philosophy of religion. And so when I read natural theologians, they, in many cases, especially contemporary ones, they tend to mostly think of general revelation as intuition, meaning you look out and you see beauty and you're intuitively struck. You see a sunset, I should say. You're struck with this intuition of beauty and only God can fulfill that intuition. But are there more ways that general revelation reveals God than, than intuition? Yeah, I think so. So I think um, uh, both the existence of the external world itself um, and so you could think of um, examples of this would be something like the argument from design. Um, so the purpose of this and the order of creation points to an orderer, um, a creator, because how did it get to be that way? That would be one way. Uh, but even our internal lives, the fact that we have reason, uh, the fact that we are moral uh, creatures, the existence of both our, our conscience and our reason um, point to um, external standards. So there's a... Um, at some level, the revelation is there, and then oftentimes we are engaged in a kind of process of reasoning, of discursive reason over time, where we fill out the logical steps, but there is a kind of intuitive um, uh, encounter with God at a primal, um, even a precognitive level. Because, And I say it's precognitive because, um, meaning it doesn't, it's not the result of a long chain of reasoning, uh, because what the Bible says is it's clearly perceived. Uh, it doesn't just say it's clearly revealed. It's clearly perceived. It's just, it, it, it's like an impression on your psyche, on your existence. Um, the reality of God is there. And then because of sin, we suppress that truth. We suppress it in unrighteousness, but that implies that it was there to be suppressed. Uh, and so whether, and so you could think through a number of different arguments. I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis. I think he does great work on this sort of stuff. Um, but Lewis, so when we flesh out those arguments, it's going to be things like the argument from reason. Well, we're reasoning creatures. We must be participating in an eternal transcendent reason, the logos, um, that gives our reasoning um, its validity. Uh, the argument from morality, we are, we're creatures who are always judging things good and evil, um, and therefore there must be a standard which we are assuming, which implies a lawgiver. The argument from desire, which is related to the argument from beauty, which is um, beauty awakens some, a desire in us. Uh, if there's no satisfaction for that desire on earth, we must begin to think we're made for something more, and that's a pointer to God. So in all cases, um, whichever whichever one you're doing, and then you could flip them around and say it's the argument from error. The fact that we think some things are false, not true, points to that that standard. That we think things are good. The argument from evil, not the problem of evil, but the argument from evil points us that direction. Uh, so all of those sort of things would be kind of fleshings out of the of the fundamental encounter of the creature with his creator at every moment of his existence yeah and and one of the things i like to do is i use westminster Shor shorter catechism question four which asks what is god and defines god mm -hmm. before we get into this question of what is god or, or how does general relation reveal god because yep. many times i find that people start with a different definition of god or they're content with a definition of God that's really, I'll call it bare bones. Mm -hmm. So they'll think they've made some great advancement if they show there's an unmoved mover and stop right. there. Right. I think there is an unmoved mover, but I think that general relation reveals the divine nature of God much right. more fully, which is one of your points coming up. But that's one thing I also point out is this is not just a bare minimal kind of higher power. Right. Um, there's a lot that you can know about God and you should have known it, which is another reason I think your first point so important which is that the nature of special revelation is also redemptive, yes. not merely kind of giving us more information. Correct. And so I thought your point was really good because when you, when you come to redemptive revelation, the assumption is you've sinned already. So your sin can't be that you rejected special revelation because special revelations explain to you what to do about your sin. Right. And so there's yep. this rejection of what's been revealed about God. And you've quoted Romans one already, which is the go-to text. Um, yep. which shows, yeah, you, your failure to do, this is why I said, I think general relations is actually a big, 
problem facing us, your failure to understand God has revealed himself is the beginning of all the rest of your problems. That's right. And, and you see, uh, so spe yeah, special revelation is special because it's not, it's, it's assuming general. Um, and it exists, like you said, um, for, for us, it's primarily in a redemptive context. It's, it's corrective to our, um, our turning aside. But even in the garden, you have an example of, of uh, special revelation when God gives sort of the moral design for the garden. You may eat from every tree except for that one. Um, that's something I, the, except that one is not something I think Adam could have discerned simply yeah. by nature, by reflection on nature. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of Genesis one and the lead up to Genesis two is that Adam by reflecting on the world around him could have concluded many things about God, not just that he exists, but aspects of his nature, right? So his power, his nature, his, that yeah. he's an orderer, that he's a provider, um, that he's even a father. Um, all of these sort of things were discernible by by virtue of the way that God had created the world. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, I mean, I think that they're probably, you're right that the first command to Adam is is special revelation, but it's also covenantal. Right. Which puts it in a different category than general revelation also. That's right. Um, but one thing I am interested, I'm always fascinated by in, in Christians reading Genesis 3 is they kind of take it for granted when you say, well, why did they, why did, why should they do what they're told by God? They say, well, God, told them well that leaves a problem of how do you know it was god and that's actually what the serpent's trying to get them to doubt did god really say that and so that means that there was some way they could know god so that when he gave them the command they could trust that and say that is indeed from god just having someone tell you something even if they say they are god doesn't prove they are uh the devil can come as an angel of light and tell you he's bringing you a, a message from god and it really isn't so just that little temptation reveals so much about what they should have known about God so that when they're told you can be as God, they should have known that's not possible. Yeah. And I think, and I think it's, yeah. So um, presumably in when God gave Adam, because Eve hadn't been created yet, but when God gave Adam the moral design in that covenantal context, um, presumably there was a kind of self-authenticating way that God manifested himself to Adam. The Lord God said to Adam, and that was, it was evident, this is God. So God, Adam had heard it from God himself, and presumably as the head of his home was to teach his wife the moral order of their new existence. Um, so Eve didn't hear it from Adam, from God directly. She heard it through a mediator, through her husband. Satan exploits that fact by approaching her yeah. and asking the catechism question, did God really say? So she, he's, so now Eve is faced with a, a challenge of she has heard about the moral design from the garden from two different sources. One is her husband and one is this, um, this serpent, which I take to be more than just like a, a little snake, but I think um, was something more like an angelic. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's described as a beast of the field, but I think it's a, um, the same way that the uh, seraphim have, you know, great wings and are serpentine in their, in their form. I think Satan may have been a fallen seraph. So he's, and so now you have this great dragon creature sort of um, asking questions and she's got to decide which is which, and she's not heard it directly from God himself. So she has to decide, am I going to trust my husband or am I going to trust this new creature? Yeah. And she, she, she goes with the creature and then yeah. Adam listens to her rather than to God um, because he had heard it directly. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that there's, it's interesting that she would trust the serpent because um, right. there is that matter of trust involved. Sometimes you don't know and you need to trust. But it's also interesting that, to me, the the temptation itself bears with it. You can be as God, knowing good and evil the way God does. Yeah. And you get into that a little bit in your, one of your books. I have it right here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. The way that God knows things is not the same way we know things. Right. And so the temptation already is something where she should have, she if she'd been doing some of her homework from general relations, she could have said, no, that's not possible. Yeah, well, or I, I think it's, I, I take the knowledge of good and evil to be um, a uh, short a way of describing mature kingly wisdom. That's how it's used elsewhere in the Bible. So Solomon, um, when he's asked, you know, when he asks, what do you want me to give you, God says. And, and Solomon yeah. says, I need a discerning mind to know good and evil. And God yeah. says, great, I'll give you wisdom. And so that's the equation that shows up again and again. So I think that Adam and Eve were intended to eventually eat from that tree. But they were they needed to get it after they had feared the Lord because it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. So first, right, yep. fear fear God, do what He says. You may not understand the reasons. So she's looking at the tree and goes, "It is, you know, good for food. It's a delight to the eyes. It's desirable to make one wise." I think all three of those things are are true, and I think therefore there was an aspect of sort of general revelation there that says, "Oh, this is good," 
And the thing that's interrupting it is actually special revelation where God is saying, but not now. Mm -hmm. That's not good for you now. Uh -huh. I'm saying, no. Do you trust your father? Do you trust me? Yeah. And she, and therefore what would have been a gift from God and would have probably been more than she could have hoped for um, is actually, um, she she neglects that in favor of the shortcut that the devil is offer, offering her, which is similar. I think there's a parallel here to what's going on with Christ. Christ is undoing this in his yeah, temptation, right, in temptation. Where, where the devil says, I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of the earth if you'll worship me. And Jesus says, well, I'm, I'm going to get the kingdoms of the earth. I intend to get those. Those are good. I want them, but I'm not going to get them as a gift from the devil. Yeah. I'm going to get them as a gift from my father. And I think Adam and Eve were in the same position to say, I'm, I want the tree. I want wisdom, but I want it from my father, not from the devil. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and with, especially with Christ, there's a, something in his promise, which is I'll give you the kingdoms, but without the cross. Exactly. Um, with Adam and Eve, I, I, there are some who read, Genesis 3, I mean, mostly they're probably not Christians like Freud, who would say, yeah, yeah they, the knowledge of good and evil meant they don't they don't know anything about good and evil. Like, And right. that, that just seems absurd because then they wouldn't know not to break commands, for example. Exactly. Um, so they, I think I agree with you. They certainly get that. But I'm wondering if there's still something in this temptation about putting yourself in the place of God. That's right. Well, because what it is, is it's, um, you know, uh, to, if you're offered wisdom— but you seize it in the wrong way, then what you really want is autonomy. So yeah. kingly wisdom in submission to God is a blessing. The same thing pursued as in, in sort of a seizing action apart from God is that quest for autonomy. I want to be like God. And the other thing that's happening with the serpent's temptation is contrary to every evidence, this is the general revelation point, where God has created them in this beautiful cosmos ordered, structured, and designed specifically for their flourishing. Yeah. Um, and they've been given dominion over it. And, 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 and then they've had special revelation, divine endorsement, just to underscore like, Hey, don't, don't think that this is just for looks, you know, you may surely eat from every tree. So you have the divine endorsement. And then Satan comes and says, Hey, isn't God stingy? Yeah. Isn't it <laughs> right? amazing? Like, like there's <laughs> one, no, there's one, no, in this world full of yes. And Satan's like, can you believe the audacity of that yeah. guy to say you can't, and he's holding something back. He's, he's got something that he doesn't want you to get. And that then becomes what Eve wants more than anything um, is the thing that she can't have. This is the you know yeah. covetousness, right? So isn't that amazing how, how quickly we're, we lacked any gratitude towards God, like you're saying, and it usually comes out in the problem of evil. Right. We'll doubt in everything you you just listed a number of things God did. We'll doubt everything God has done because I'm suffering. Right. Uh, and therefore, maybe God doesn't even exist. So yeah, that's a great point. Now, uh, uh, for your second point here, kind of builds on the first one. General relation has an ontological and epistemological priority over Scripture. Again, I think that's right on. And, yep. and um, I might even add existential or redemptive, meaning what I said in point one, which is that we've sinned by rejecting God's clear revelation. And that comes that that reality of sin is why we need scripture. Yeah. Um, but but explain the, the points yeah. here for those watching ontological yeah, so, and epistemological priority. Yeah, so I'm getting these categories. Um, I was really helped by this years ago from uh, a book by Vern Poitras. And I want to say it's his book on redeeming science. He's got a number of different books on different disciplines. I'm pretty sure it's the redeeming science one. And uh, in it, he, he says, so ontology is the study of being and epistemology is the study of knowledge. And so the bef general revelation is, has a priority. It comes first in being because you have, like you said, you have to exist. Um, you have to be and, and the world has to be before you can talk about the world, which is what scripture does. And, um, there you need to know about the world that's the epistemology piece before scripture can refer to it so i think the example i use here is the heavens so the heavens declare the glory of god well there has to the heavens have to exist and you have to know about them before that statement in the bible means anything you could do the same thing with something like behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world and it's like you need the lambs need to exist and you need to know about them and in that case you actually need to know something about the the yeah. function in a sacrificial system um, that all has to come first ontology. It exists and epistemology, you know, about the thing, and then scripture can come in and clarify, um, highlight, point out, reframe, draw out implications. Scripture can do all of that reground, give you more details, give you more information. Um, all of that comes in, but the first thing is it has to exist and you have to know about it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, that's really helpful. And I think that also then sets up the next point too. Um, special revelation has linguistic priority over general revelation. And this, this specific point really got me interested because you hit on something which most of the time when I talk to uh, believers, especially in the reform world, which is the world I'm in, your world you're in, uh, they'll say, well, scriptures are more clear. Right. And so we need them over general revelation. And they'll say things like, well, because of the fall, scriptures are more clear than general revelation. Maybe general revelation would have been more clear before the fall, maybe not, yeah. but especially because of the fall. But you clarify when you say yeah. that special revelation has linguistic priority, you're not saying that it nature is obscure or unclear. The heavens clearly declare the glory of God. So can you explain that? Yeah. So, I um, mean, yeah, it's coming straight out of that, again, that Romans passage, every, it's been clearly perceived. So the idea is that clarity or perspicuity, which is what we talk about when we talk about the doctrine of scripture, scripture is perspicuous or clear. Um, general revelation has that same attribute. Um, what people are picking up on is, well, but why do I know more things about God because of words than I do because of nature? And it's like, well, because God is saying more in the Bible than he is saying in nature. Um, and so uh, one way to think about it is if um, if I'm if my child, I've got say I've got a, I've got a five year old. Um, if all of a sudden from the other room, I hear a wail, just a, you know, he's a scream. OK, um, at one level, he's being perfectly clear. Something is wrong. OK, it's clear. Now, there's a lot of things I don't know. Because he's not, if I go in there and I calm him down and say, what happened? And he starts telling me, I slammed my finger in the door. Um, I get more information because he's using the words. But it wasn't because the whale was unclear in terms of what he was intending to communicate, which is, I'm hurt. Mm -hmm. In a similar way, God intends to communicate certain things through the natural order. And he's perfectly clear about it. And we are, we clearly perceive it. And then as sinners, suppress it. Um, so it's clear. But. Um, language, words, because of the way God has built us as reasoning creatures and speaking creatures, uh, the language actually helps us to drill down, to get more specific, to draw out meaning and implications uh, of what God has done in history or in creation. And so in that sense, um, we, words really matter. Mm -hmm. But part of the point here is the world is made up of words. God speaks it into existence yeah. and he's clear in what he speaks in the stuff. Yeah, that's right. And I think the the uh, point that it's clear, I also add a word full. I say yeah, general revelation is clear and full. And what I mean by that is you can get the whole definition of God from shorter catechism question four. You can know each of those steps about who God is from general revelation right. rather than saying you only know a vague sort of higher power. I need the Bible to fill the details in. Correct. So I'd say in that sense, it's full. Um, but one thing that stood out to me that I liked was you said the obscurity we may feel. Yeah. And the reason why that was, I thought that was important is because it is true. People feel like general relations obscure, but it is a feeling yeah. and we can't use that to then judge God's ability to communicate with us. Right. Because yeah. the truth of the matter is many people, both believers and unbelievers claim that scripture is unclear. Right. And scripture has been a source of, I mean, there's probably more divisions over scripture than over general relation. So yep. it's been a source of divisions and arguing and tensions and even wars. I don't know. There's probably been a war over general relation, um, but certainly over scripture. So the idea that because I feel it's obscure, well, that really just is a comment about your own work yep. that you've done or lack of work so far in discovering what God has shown. And I think that this is one of the things. So, um, the, the, because of the way that general revelation works, because it's revealing itself in sort of the ordering of the cosmos, the ordering in, of the human mind and soul, and then the interplay of those as we reflect upon it, it does require a certain measure in order to reach conclusions like Westminster question number four. In order to reach those conclusions, you do have to have a certain kind of clarity of mind in order to be able to follow the, the argument. Why is God a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable? you know, what's the chain of reasoning that gets you from the world that exists to those conclusions about the God who made it? That's actually a difficult thing to do. It's difficult because we're finite. It's difficult. So we have limitations and it's difficult because we're fallen. We have weaknesses and because we're sinful. And so what people often feel like is, yeah, you, so it's in principle, we want to be able to say, yeah, you can get there through, re it's all there in principle, but because of our weakness and our wickedness and our limitations, um, God comes along and says, hey, 
the Lord is a spirit <laughs> and he's, and he says it directly and it's kind of a shortcut, which is, yeah. I, and I can't remember if I do it in this article, uh, but other, there's other places when I've talked on this where it's, it's not unlike, um, you know, Jesus, when he says um, in Matthew six, when he's encouraging us to deal with our anxieties, don't be anxious about your life. Um, he points at the birds and he points at the lilies and he says, consider those. And the implication is there is by reflection, if you think about the birds and that God made the birds yeah, and that like the birds it. eat and that he provides, you could reason your, and then you could say, oh yeah, down here, there it is. Good. Here's where you do um, that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, good. So yeah, that's the point is that um, the this is clear that God does this and you could follow the chain of reasoning if you take the time to actually consider birds and God yep. and provision and then you're more valuable than birds. So you'd have to have some notion there that you're comparing you to birds and which one does God value more based on the kind of capacities and abilities we have. And you could get to the point where based on God provides for birds, therefore he'll provide for me. Therefore I shouldn't be anxious. And all, and what Jesus is saying is that all of that is doable, yeah. but then he also, he draws attention to it in words yeah. and gives you the shortcut. Right. So he says, yeah. I know that some of you are going to get lost in this in this argument. So I'm just going to say, don't be anxious. You're not little flock. I'll, I'll take care of you. And, yeah, and I he, wonder if there's something like, like um, when, when we're told that God spoke to Moses face to face, not yeah. in signs or symbols. Yeah. So there's something about God communicating directly yeah. um, that gets the message across and is very intimate and familiar. I mean, as humans, I think it should kind of blow our mind that we have I mean, general relation, but also special relation that God did decide, hey, here this is, here's how you're redeemed. So I think yeah. that's right. That gets the idea that this is um, telling us something very directly. Now, um, one one question I had though about that, I, I like the fact that you bring up, you know, it's going to take a thought process yep. to understand general relation. And it is true there's some direct things that could be said in scripture, but it's also true that we're we're told to go on to maturity in scripture. Yep. And, and there, we're we're going to have to exercise our minds, of course, to understand scripture as well. And yep. so it seems like both for both is true. We need maturity, just generally speaking, whether we're reading general or special revelation. Absolutely. But I think it would be something like um, the basics um, of one are more directly accessible even to the immature than the other. So um, something like God will care for you um, if you only had general revelation would require more maturity than if mom tells a five-year-old God will take care of you. Like the, the direct words from the Bible from a, from a mother to her son um, has a like he doesn't all he has to do is say, OK, I believe that. Um, he doesn't have to do any reasoning. He doesn't have to do any long chain or um, something like, um, you know, God's name is on your head and and God's name and Jesus is in your heart. Jesus name is on your head because you've been baptized into his name and he, the spirit's in your heart. That sort of direct statement can be understood, comprehended and and relied upon by a child, whereas it would take a lot of reasoning uh, to get there by an adult. And so that's that's the kind of thing I have in mind there is that, yes, a full understanding of Scripture does require maturity, as Hebrews 6 teaches. We, we need to move on to maturity. But there's a kind of basics uh, simplicity. Jesus is Lord. Call upon his name um, that can be real direct and basic and and for the, for children um, and, and the immature that uh, that general revelation kind of always requires more thinking because it's confusing. And what what is God saying and how do we follow this train of thought and that sort of stuff? Yeah, I wonder if um, the way, especially then, that the child becomes mature is because they're challenged. So, for example, they say, you know, trust your father, but then they get a challenge just like the serpent that raises some doubts, but their father is trustworthy, so they have to reason through it. So part of maturity yes. might be that process, right, where we absolutely. go from, absolutely. I was just told something, and now I understand. And that kind of gets me to the fourth point here, um, where you get into Romans 1, and it always raises an interesting question for me, again, as a philosopher and someone who's studied epistemology. Um, you, you, you say the obscurity of general relation, which we experience, is not only owing to the fact that it takes time, effort, and maturity to comprehend God's revelation, but it's also due to the fall. And so that's when you get into, because of our truth-suppressing rebellion, yeah. and when you say we suppress what we know, in what sense do humans know it? Yep. So... Um... So I, th this is going to get into your kind of your psychology of the human mind. And I'm, I'm one who adopts a, um, 
a tiered psychology where, um, and what that means is we have an intellect, which apprehends truth, and you have a will, which clings to the good. So that's the, that's the highest level. Intellect and will are the, the top of my tier. And then there's this, at the bottom, you've got sort of the automatic bodily processes, um, sort of the you know, growth and digestion, which you don't think about, you don't choose. When in the middle, there's this L area um, that the older theologians, medieval theologians called the sense apprehension and the sense appetite. Um, I think the Bible ropes that into like the body. Um, so the body in its moral dimension, not the body in its uh, non-moral or, or digestive and breathing. Yeah. That's not moral. But the body, when, the, when it talks about the, the, body, the desires of the body or the desires of the flesh, that sort of thing, that's this lower level or middle, middle tier. And, uh, and those can be in conflict with each other because that middle tier says, oh, that, that looks good. I want it, um, even though it's not good for me. So, uh, or God has said, don't. And so that creates a certain kind of conflict. And then um, if we allow that middle tier to run the show, if we're enslaved to our passions and our emotions and our desires, um, then our, what that means is our minds follow along and rationalize whatever the, whatever the desires want. So, the, so the, here, I want that. Um, oh, therefore, it must be good to me. And you rationalize and explain it, explain everything away. When that's happening, um, you both know and you don't know. So there's a way in which... Um, there's an internal conflict or division in the human soul where I know what's good. I know what's right. Um, I know what God has said. That's, in, that's pressing itself upon my reason and my imagination and my conscience. But because of my sinfulness, I'm doing my dead level best to ignore it, suppress it. But the very fact of suppressive, suppression implies pressure from the other direction. So that pressure from the other direction is what's always there. And then the success of our truth suppression is why we can say, no, there is no God, which is why the, the psalm can say, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, because the fool is having to suppress something that is evident, obvious, and present in his own very being. Yeah, and how much of that, I, I like that, the division, I, I presented it that way also, because um, I, one of, it's, it's called acrosia, right, in, in Greek. That's been one of my areas of study, okay. which is, can you knowingly do evil? And it, it yeah. interestingly raises some problems because when most people, when you ask them that question, can you knowingly do evil? They'll say, of course, I just did well, it yeah, yesterday. Yeah, right. Um, but it actually raises some problems. As you're pointing out, if your will is directed to what you think is good, right? then you, you it's not directed to what you think is evil. You're doing what you think is good, but you're wrong. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you're right about that division. Um, and the question I always have though, is how much, gets through so to speak in other words you've been using the phrase um you know it's it's presented to us which i think is absolutely right but yep. if we were to go out and just sort of go to the mall yep. and ask people to write down what they know about god i think they know almost nothing right so yeah, i'm and, and so i think yeah this is where um so the, what romans one teaches is even in a godless culture right so which romans one is describing sort of the gentile world um yeah, which is hostile to God. And so even then, Paul can say they know it and they're without excuse. So there's always sufficient knowledge to condemn because the, the base thing that they need to know is they need to know something about the nature uh, and character of God. That's what's revealed. That's what's clearly perceived. And then the expectation is having known it with the mind, they respond rightfully to it with the heart, with the will. Um, and what would that right response be? It would be worship and gratitude. So God is supreme. I worship him. And then he's kind and good and look at all the gifts. I'm grateful. Um, whereas what Romans 1 says is, although they knew God, so they're, they're, they know something, that's the revelation pressing upon them. They did not honor him as God or give thanks. So now we have idolatry and ingratitude. So it's that moral thing. And therefore, they're without excuse and they're condemned. So in that sense, there's always enough to condemn. It's sufficient to condemn, as I think I say there in, in point yeah. five down below, right? Um, general revelation is sufficient to condemn. One of the things that's relevant here, though, is um, the way that wicked cuss. So there's a line in Richard Hooker where he talks about um, the, that the light of natural understanding sort of can't be completely obliterated, but it can be sort of suffocated and, and smothered by wicked, what he calls wicked custom. And so that's the habits of a given culture where by repeated practice, by social pressure, by example and modeling, um, the light of nature, which is embedded directly in every human mind and heart, right? That light that God is, that natural revelation that's there, 
is sort of continually seared by the environment in which they find themselves. So this is how you get sort of the you know human sacrifice, you know, which is abhorrent to the light of nature. Nature says, no, this God is God. You should worship and obey him. This creature like you is made in his image and therefore you should not kill him. Yeah. And yet we're smothering that in favor of something else. And it's by habit that we be, sort of acclimate ourselves. Uh, and so there's a way in which, um, here's kind of an interesting parallel. I would say in the same way that in the individual, um, our choices can condition and habituate our being towards sin, which I think this is what Paul means by the the flesh. It sort of has this bent and directedness that's corrupted. It's turned aside towards sin, um, sort of the body and its desires as habituated by sin. Cultures can do the same thing. I think that's what the Bible means yeah. by the world. The world, um, in its negative, when the Bible used that in a negative sense, is basically human society, human social order, habituated and conditioned by sinfulness and under a curse um and therefore and those those go together the, they they reinforce each other in that truth suppressing rebellion uh against god but part of what paul's doing in romans one is to say um but reality is stubborn god still has a flag planted in every human heart and mind yeah. of his manifest um goodness and existence yeah that yeah especially that especially once someone tries to make sense of I would add on their eternality. Yep. Um, any system like a materialist system tries to make sense of eternality and just can't do it. Right. Um, but I also, I think that the idea of culpable ignorance yep. is a very powerful but overlooked reality. So for example, in Isaiah chapter one, God says, my people don't know me. Yep. Which is to say you, you should know him though. Right. And so I think that's also an important part of Romans one, yep. which is that God's revealed all these things in, in other words, so if the atheist tries to attack this moral or, or this this uh, psychological philosophy and say, hey, I, I don't know about this idea that I, I know it, but I'm suppressing it, even if we granted that to them, yep. there's a whole bunch of stuff they should have known about God and didn't know about God. That's right. So in uh, so the parallel, another parallel passage to that would be Ephesians 4 is the classic here, I think, where it talks about the Gentiles who are in the, in the futility of their minds, which is yeah. an echo of Romans 1. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God. Why? Why are they alienated from God's life? Because of the ignorance in them. And you think, oh, well, they're ignorant. They don't know. Yeah. Due to the hardness of their heart. So the ignorance, so the deep, there's something deeper than ignorance here. It's this is what's a, why it's a culpable ignorance, is because the ignorance is flowing from a hardness of heart. And and it's that combination: hard heart, ignorance, rejection, truth, suppression. I don't, there's no God. And that alienates them, it darkens their understanding makes their minds futile. That's, that's how it goes. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, so in point five, when you say generation is sufficient to condemn us, I, I agree with that. And I don't think you mean that's all it's for, but nope. I want to raise this question because a, a lot of times when I do discuss generation, people will limit it to that, that that's the whole point of it is to condemn us right. versus really, I mean, what you develop in your book is yeah. right. generation as our source of the knowledge of God is a source of great joy. Yeah, so in insofar as we're talking about um, the natural man, all general revelation can do is condemn. It, it, it can't get yeah. them. It can't get you. That's to right. Yeah. Once you once you've become a Christian, however, now general revelation serves your sanctification. So having been having been born again, now you basically have eyes to see, ears to hear, and now you can find God everywhere, which is what things of earth is about. Is is saying now you've you've kind of God's opened your eyes, opened your heart. Um, you can see him in the word, you see Christ as glorious in the scriptures. And then now through the scriptures, you see everything else. Now you're reading everything sort of with, with the biblical lens yeah. and, and the world's opened up to you. So now, now you see, um, you see resurrections everywhere, right? And every day the sun dies. And then the next day it comes flying out of the grave, just like Jesus did. Uh, every year, um, the world dies you know, winter comes and everything dies. And then all of a sudden here comes spring again. And it's like, it's a resurrection every year. And so that's something that is, it's always there. And I think God is always communicating that. But until you've believed the gospel, until you've believed the gospel, you won't hear that message because you won't have the right frame. You won't that's have right, that yeah. gospel frame in order to see Christ in sunrises and springtime. And I think that's part of the worry for reformed people is that, 
you know, the, the first section of the Westminster Confession affirms there is a clear general revelation, but it's not sufficient for salvation. But there's a worry that people might look to just creation. So, for example, Thomas Paine right. said, nature is my church. Now, I think yep. Thomas Paine's problem is not only that he rejected the Bible, but that he didn't really understand general revelation or nature either. Right. So yep. I, I kind of worry about giving a Thomas Paine figure too much. Like it's almost like we're conceding he did general revelation, but he just didn't get the Bible well, instead of saying, no, he actually didn't do general revelation very well either. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, Christendom, um, that's, that's the sort of problem that only happens in Christendom. So it's, it's once the gospel, this is the, ob, uh, the opposite of the wicked custom that suppresses the light of nature in a Christian society. Um, Jonathan Edwards talks about this in his treatise on the end for which God created the world, that basically the gospel has assisted natural reason in getting farther than natural reason ever could have on its own. So natural reason, even so now um, unregenerate people in a Christian society, by virtue of the habits that have been formed in that society and the, the work of the gospel and penetrating into various spheres, they actually see more. And the mistake they make is the one is the Romans one one. They don't honor God as God and they don't give thanks. They think it's just that. So this is the, um, you know, Jefferson's um, an unbeliever. Um, he doesn't believe in Christ for his salvation. Um, but he's, he says, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. This is obvious. You couldn't miss this for anything. It's like, well, actually, the equality of men as uh, in, inalienable rights coming from God is the sort of thing that lots of societies missed right? The reason you think they're self-evident is because at one level, at a base level, it is natural revelation, but also because you live in a Christian society, which is reinforced and taught that for centuries. Yeah. Whereas in a, you know, in the Aztec society, if you would have said, hey guys, it's self-evident that we've been endowed with our creator, creator with certain alien rights and life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. The Aztecs would have looked at you like you were bonkers. And, and you would have had a point because it's true, we're all made in God's image and therefore have those rights. But it's also the case that they've lived in a culture which has smothered that, that light of nature, and therefore they're going to think you're crazy. So Christian societies trick unbelievers into thinking certain things are natural um, when they've that, that nature has actually been assisted by grace for centuries yeah. to make it as clear as it is. Yeah, I think that's true. And I, you know, one thing, I actually wrote a book about that line on the Declaration of Independence, because one thing that stands out to me from that is that the truth about equality is based on the idea that we're created equal, right. which means there's a creator. Right. And and that's quickly brushed over. People quickly move on to the equal yeah. with rights. But wait a minute. Those are only true if that first part's true, that there's a creator, right. uh, which goes to your point about the Aztecs. You know, polytheistic systems can support that idea. Right. So, yeah, I think that's that's really important. And then, then good point about Thomas Jefferson, too, who he can write that down. But in his own life, he doesn't see his own need for redemption. And he doesn't glorify God and worship him as he should be worshiped. Yes. So, yeah, that's really good. And um, I really appreciate your article here and yeah. and uh, looking forward to reading your book on leadership. Yeah. Thanks for taking time to talk with us about general relation. I think it's, again, such an important point for Christians to understand how God has revealed himself to us in all of his works. Very good. Thanks so, so much for having me, Owen.